Thank you for joining my presentation today. This is an honor and I am grateful at this opportunity to speak to you. As much as I would have liked to have been able to present this to you in person from my hometown in Honolulu, given the times we are in, we have to do what we can. Before I begin, some housekeeping issues I like to address. I have no conflicts of interest, nor do I have any dual financial commitments. However, I suppose if I was to disclose academic conflicts, I was trained at the University of Pennsylvania and currently teach part-time at Temple University. Today's presentation is on post collapse and diagnostic grading of periodontitis. Having been trained at Penn, my journey to this topic started as a student, and if you were educated in the Northeast, in and around the Philadelphia area, then you couldn't escape learning about bite collapse. As you listen to this presentation, please keep in mind that this is only a small part of a larger discussion on bite collapse. As a dental student, under the training of my clinical group leader, Dr. David Weinstock, it seemed that every patient presented in treatment planning seminars had posterior bite collapse. Because the term seemed to be so widely misunderstood, as a postgraduate resident, I decided to write my first article on the topic. The first draft of which I showed to Dr. Arnold Weisgold, he then directed me to show it to Dr. Edwin Rosenberg, and then finally to Dr. Morton Amsterdam, and it is with his blessing that it was subsequently published in the Penn Dental Journal. This was also the start of my educational relationship with Dr. Amsterdam since his retirement from teaching up until his passing. Little did I know that 20 years later, partly after the urging of Dr. Tom Rams, we would be returning to the subject and least of all that I'd be the one speaking to you about it. So why are we talking about this today? As you know, in 2017, the World Workshop on the Sort of Classification of Periodontal and Imperial Implant Diseases and Conditions provided a grading system for periodontitis. And this was published by this academy. Then in 2018, in the journal Clinical Perio, Tonietti et al restated the conclusions for the World Workshop, and they stated that stage four periodontitis includes bite collapse, drifting, flaring, and less than 20 teeth remaining, and that the difference between stage three and stage four periodontitis includes poster bite collapse. Now this is fine, but when we look through the article, although there are numerous references to the inclusion of bite collapse in diagnosing stage four periodontitis, there appears to be no clinical def definition nor description of bite collapse in the article. There is, however, a reference to an article from 1976 by Neiman and Lindy. And when we review this case presentation article, uh, again, there appears to be no reference to the term posterior bite collapse in diagnosing their case. So what exactly is posterior bite collapse? When we do a literature search, a number of articles pop up through the years, and with the most pertinent being the ones that I've noted here. Unfortunately, over the convening years since its first publication, bite collapse has taken on different definitions, often complicating rather than elucidating its clinical presentation. Schiffman et al. in 1998 stated that although there are different definitions of bite collapse, only the classical definition by Amsterdam provides a definite diagnosis and treatment plan. They proceed to describe its clinical course as well as delineate its ideology. However, I disagree with the subsequent statements for as you will see, flaring and loss of vertical dimension do not always occur in bite collapse and the other factors described should not be discounted as ideologic factors of bite collapse. And when we look back at the original definition um, from 1964 by Amsterdam Abrams, they outlined five ideologic factors with the majority of cases being the result of the premature loss of the six-year molar. And this could result in the following secondary clinical sequelae, which includes drifting and tilting of teeth, mandibular displacement, increased mobility, flaring of the anterior teeth, and loss of vertical dimension. 
Perhaps an updated definition of bicollapse should be a means to diagnose a clinical syndrome with multiple, often pathologic etiologic factors that deviates from a normal or ideal occlusion where the posterior occlusion is compromised and ultimately may result in the destruction of the functional protective capacity of the entire dentition. Secondary clinical sequelae may include the accelerated progression of periodontitis, TMD, increasing mobility or fremitus, additional tooth loss, flaring of the anterior teeth, and loss of occlusive vertical dimension. Etiologic factors may include, but are not limited to, singularly or in combination with, premature loss without replacement, orthodontic malocclusion and dental skeletal disharmonies, periodontitis, accelerated retrograde occlusal or interproximal wear, reduction of proximal contacts through iatrogenic or conformative dentistry, or severe caries. So let's take a look at some clinical examples of bite collapse. When you hear the term bite collapse, more than likely you would imagine cases such as this. Or you may imagine cases such as these. Although both present with active periodontitis, increased mobility, flaring, and loss of vertical, in the top example, we have multiple missing teeth without replacement, while in the bottom, we do not. And how about these cases? In the top example, we have missing teeth, no active periodontitis, severe occlusal wear, loss of vertical dimension, and no anterior flaring. In the bottom example, we have missing teeth, no substantial loss in vertical dimension, and no anterior flaring. And in these cases, neither have missing teeth, nor active periodontitis, yet they present with severe malocclusions, no flaring, no increasing mobility patterns. One has a stable vertical, the other has a reduced vertical, but both of which are the result of dental skeletal discrepancies. And because they both deviate from ideal occlusion, they can be diagnosed with bite collapse. The etiologic basis for bite collapse can be generalized into these three factors, dental, periodontal, or skeletal, and which are in of, of themselves also interrelated. Additionally, the clinical presentation of bite collapse can vary depending upon angles classification, where there is more anterior flaring in the class one and class two div one malocclusions than in the class two div two and class three malocclusions. So how can we better define bite collapse? In an article to be published in the International Journal of Perio and Restorative Dentistry, we have attempted to set up a grading system for bite collapse, the basis of which is the assumption that all bite collapse cases deviate from an ideal occlusion. They can either have or not have missing teeth, and they may or may not have active periodontitis. These cases may potentially present with a secondary clinical sequelae of increasing fremitus or mobility, presence or absence of anterior flying, presence or absence of vertical dimension loss. We propose four grades of bite collapse, starting with grade one, malocclusion without missing teeth, no active periodontitis, potentially presenting with mobility or fremitus, anterior flaring or loss of vertical dimension. I won't be going into how to treat these cases, but that's a topic for another time. This would be an example of grade one collapse, a class two div two malocclusion. It is periodontally stable with no anterior flaring. The decreased vertical is due to a dental skeletal discrepancy. This would be another example of grade one bite collapse with a class two div two malocclusion. And this also is periodontally stable. There are no missing teeth and no anterior flaring is seen. In this case, however, with the increased retrograde wear, we can suspect a loss of vertical dimension. In this class three malocclusion, which you have seen before, um, this is a grade one bite collapse case. It is periodontally stable. We have no missing teeth, no anti flaring, and a possible loss of vertical dimension. 
Moving on to grade two bite collapse, which present with a malocclusion, missing teeth, and are periodontally stable. These may present with mobility or fremitus, anterior flying, or loss of vertical dimension. This is an example of grade two collapse. It is periodontally stable. There are missing teeth without replacement, without anterior flaring. There's potential loss of vertical dimension. However, in the absence of increasing mobility, fremitus, or retrograde wear, we would not suspect a decrease in vertical. Another example of grade two collapse, in this case, we see missing teeth, anterior flaring, and loss of vertical. Although there may have been a history of active periodontitis, the patient is stable having undergone periodontal and maintenance therapy. This grade two collapse, which you have seen previously, presents with missing teeth and is predominantly stable with no anterior flaring. And yet we see loss of vertical dimension due to the accelerated retrograde wear. Next, looking at the grade three bite collapse. Here we have a malocclusion with no teeth are missing in the presence of active periodontitis and potentially presenting with mobility or fremitus, anterior flaring, or loss of vertical dimension. In this grade three case, which you've seen previously, there's active periodontitis, no missing teeth, yet we see anterior flaring, increasing mobility and fremitus, and loss in vertical dimension. Finally, grade four bite collapse, more typically in line with stage four periodontitis. Here we have a malocclusion with active periodontitis, missing teeth and potentially presenting with mobility or fremitus, anterior flaring or loss of vertical dimension. In this grade four case, although we may have active periodontitis, missing teeth, accelerated mesial drifting of the posterior quadrants, increasing mobility and fremitus, Yet, there is no detectable loss of vertical dimension and no anterior flaring. And finally, another grade four collapse case. Here again, we have active periodontitis, missing teeth, loss in vertical dimension. Of course, we don't see anterior flaring due to the fixed bridge work as well as the class two div two malocclusion. In diagnosing bite collapse and to assist in developing a treatment plan, I would recommend using a table such as this where you're able to check off your clinical findings. In summary, in diagnosing bite collapse, since it is a multifactorial syndrome with multiple etiologic factors, it is critical to determine what we're looking at clinically so we can better develop an effective treatment plan for our patients. To close with a quotation from Dr. Amsterdam, there may be many ways to treat a case, but there can be only one correct diagnosis. I hope that this grading system together with diagnostic table will assist you in formulating a treatment plan for your patients. Thank you for your time and attention.